sex. Sex? Sex! I'm about to get the great British public talking about sex. And why? Because we need to. When it comes to sex, Britain is in meltdown. And those most at risk are our children. How many people do you reckon you slept with? Oh, about 60. We've got the worst ever rate of sexual diseases among young people. Over 20 schoolgirls get pregnant every day. And most alarming of all, teenagers have unlimited access to extreme pornography. Nudity is pretty much everywhere. You see all naked bodies all the time on like the internet. We've conducted the largest ever television survey of teenage attitudes to sex. Over the next six weeks, we'll find out what they know. We try to get as many people in the hot tub as possible. One time we had um, two sisters in here. Kind of a bit jolly. What they don't know. I don't know much about contraception. I've heard the word, but I don't know what it really is. And what they really need to know. This will be your sex for life. All right, boys. But it's not just teens who need sex education. I'm Anna Richardson, a 37-year-old journalist, and like the rest of us, I'm bombarded with messages about sex. From what we should be doing... You need to be having sex three to four times a week. No, I've got time. <laughs> ..to what we aren't doing enough. Who uses condoms? <laughs> Not to mention the constant stream of books, gadgets and fads that claim to make you better in bed and improve your sex life. Have a dozen oysters, please. But how much of it is nonsense? And are there things that can genuinely help you to live a happier and more fulfilled sex life? I'm on a mission to find out. Plus, I've got together a group of men and women who are prepared to talk openly and frankly about sex. Welcome to the Sex Education Show. Nobody but you and me. We've got it together, baby. Who would like to get into bed with me? I'm on a mission to get buttoned up Britain talking about sex. Come on, guys, let's talk about sex. Boys! No? I want to find out why we're so reluctant to open up. They're running away. Come on, let's talk about sex, guys. What are doing wrong? I never thought it would actually be this hard to get people to talk about sex. Come on. Let's talk about sex, baby. Let's talk about... Mind if I keep my shoes on? Do you think that we communicate enough when it comes to sex? Oh, gosh, no. <laughs> Hands up. Who here has had sex? <laughs> Are you adventurous? <laughs> you can whisper. Just whisper something. No, no. How many people have you slept with in your life? Don't be shy. It's no. <laughs> Just treat me like your mother. No, I can't. Can I have a kiss? Come on. Let's talk about sex. Only one. <laughs> no one wants to talk. So what, that's it? You're never going to call? It's over? We all seem to suffer from a peculiar British disease. We're too embarrassed to talk about sex. <laughs> Why are we, as Brits, so bad at talking about sex? Can somebody please enlighten me? It's because people sort of value their privacy here. People might not necessarily want to tell everybody and anybody about what they get up to late at night or first thing in the morning. So, so well, who taught you about sex? Well, I can just remember my mother, like, mentioning it lightly over breakfast one morning, that, you know, <laughs> <laughs> as she was spreading the toasted butter, that, um, you know, some boys will like boys, some boys will like girls, some girls will like girls and whatever, and it's OK. She never sort of... And she said, well, as you get older, you know, you'll get urges and stuff, but we'll talk about that then. Did anybody here get absolutely no sex education? We were taught to look at toads in the science department. Toads? Toads. Toads? toads. Right. What to and and what, what was it about well, the toads? They were, leaping, they were so leaping on top of each other, and we were supposed to understand what that was all about. You watched... Without any explanation, and then we had to cut them up. You watched frogs shagging? Yeah, it was ghastly. I think things go wrong from a very early age that make us have this sort of British taboo around talking about sex. We have this situation where there's teachers and there's parents and adults who find it hard to talk openly about sex and sexuality and relationships but there's a media that's very free to sexualize and i think we're caught between those two extremes okay and we have to start breaking that down and adults have to be brave and they have to start learning to become comfortable with talking in a normal way about these topics and then we might move towards that more european kind of attitude which i think is quite healthy so do we need to talk more openly about sex 
We asked 100 men and women and 72% said yes, we need more communication when it comes to sex. At 37 years of age, I've got a great life, great job, and I'm in a happy, stable relationship. But when it comes to sex, like everyone else, I've got my share of worries and anxieties. I feel the pressure to have a great sex life. Am I doing it enough, and could I be doing it better? I've been with my other half for um, nearly 13 years. When we first met, because he's so entertaining, you know, we were shagging all the time. Spin forward 13 years. And I get quite excited by fleecy pyjamas, lying in my lovely girly bedroom with a nice cup of cocoa stroking the cat. And that isn't a metaphor. But, you know, I literally do... I would prefer to be with my pets. But what is the secret of a good sex life? Every day we're bombarded with images of perfectly groomed people. And the trend these days is to whip your hair off down below. And I'm not just talking about your legs. Up to now, I've resisted, but people keep telling me it does wonders for your sex life. Can there be any truth in it? Maybe part of the reason my sex life isn't exactly sizzling is because, I mean, after so long together, you kind of let things slide a little bit, don't you, physically? And I'm getting quite hairy. So my armpit hair, you know, is stubbly. My leg hair, I've completely let go. I'm really stubbly. I've even got toe hair. And I've got to confess that as I get older, I've grown a bum beard. Literally, I've grown a bum beard sprouting out of my backside. And in terms of the bikini line, I know that one has to tend the lawn, but I'm not particularly good at it. There are the old spider's legs hanging out of my pants. So, truthfully, if I am going to improve my sex life, I probably need to go for a bikini wax. Coming up, okay. will I dare to go bare? When we go inside. <laughs> inside? A team of footballers Scoop. get a lesson in condom size. Drop him! <laughs> Plus, we'll show parents the shocking material their kids are really ah. watching. That is most definitely wrong. Anybody want to talk about sex with me? I'm on a mission to get buttoned-up Britain talking about sex so we can have happier, healthier relationships with our partners and our bodies. Women are under a lot of pressure to look perfectly groomed. No, I'm not talking about doing your hair or wearing a nice dress, but keeping trim down below. British women spend £280 million a year removing body hair. It's claimed that waxing makes you look and feel more feminine and sexy. Call me old-fashioned, but I've always found waxing your privates a bit extreme. But could I be missing out? I've got to tell you, I'm a bikini wax virgin. And I'm absolutely bricking it. Just like clothes, our pubic hair is subject to the laws of fashion. The bikini wax was born in the 50s when skimpy swimwear was all the rage. But the 70s marked a turning point in sexual and social history, and women reverted back to a more natural look. By the 80s, the itsy bitsy teeny weeny bikini seen on the beaches of Rio gave birth to the Brazilian, otherwise known as a landing strip. In the 90s, porn stars started to bear all. The rest of us soon followed suit, and the Hollywood was born. The beauty industry sells a belief that going bare can dramatically improve your sex life. I'm about to put that claim to the test. Good to see you, Julia. How are you? I'm, uh, to be honest, a bit scared. I can see that. I can. F the way you walk downstairs, I saw this woman never had waxing in her life. Attilia Roberts has been waxing Britain's bits for over 30 years. I take you to my little room. This is absolutely bonkers. Honestly, I mean, she's just saying strip. Attilia was one of the first beauticians in the UK to offer the complete waxing service. Uh, we're just going to give you a Hollywood. What so is a Hollywood? Going, Hollywood, that's where we remove everything. And then firstly, I just have to, to clean you up a bit. I'm going to put a talc powder to make sure that skin... Talc? OK, yeah. why do we have talc? Just to protect the skin from uh, from tearing. Oh, OK, because from tearing. Tear, tearing, tearing, tearing. Right. <laughs> because... Now you've got a nervous giggle. Have I? No. <laughs> deep, deep breath, please. OK. And just hold it. OK? Ow! So if you just take a deep breath yep. and hold it... OK, I didn't take the deep breath. OK, fine. Yeah, that was not that bad. The eyes are watering. Oh, oh I okay. don't see any. And, but do you think it, it can improve your sex life? Men find this part without the hair quite exciting, isn't it? You can take a deep breath. <laughs> Ow! 
Oh, oh. When we go inside. <laughs> inside? Take a deep, deep okay. breath. Okay. Oh. <laughs> now, you look like a little baby. It looks just lovely. Do you want to have a look at yourself, maybe? Oh, okay. Have a look. It's at the moment, it's a bit pink. But tonight is going to be lovely. Isn't <laughs> it? <laughs> Honest to God. Yeah. I am blushing. No. But it's nice. You like it? Well, well I've never seen myself look like <laughs> that. Because you're a, you don't remember. When I don't remember. Like when, you know, that's instantly taking me back to being quite a young yeah. girl. Yeah. That's a bit and, weird. Yeah. And give me a ring and tell me what your boyfriend is. I'll call you back yeah. and let you know. Yeah. Oh, I'm a bit like a plucked chicken. Then they're going to take madame around in a minute and we have to look at the behind. I'm taking one for the team. I can't believe. I never even knew that this kind of thing really went on, but it does. Underground, in all those salons around the UK, there are people like Atelia getting great pleasure out of actually picking hairs out of your crop. So now you have everything removed. Hopefully when you go home tonight, the men of your dreams will like it. And you send me a bunch of flowers tomorrow. <laughs> I will do it, I promise I'll yeah. let you know And I think goes. hopefully your sex life will improve. And I can give you 100% guarantee it will. If you've never had a bikini wax before, it hurts! Don't let people tell you that it doesn't. It really, really hurts. But I have to say, I do feel the wind beneath my wings, as it were. <laughs> um, yeah, and hopefully it's going to make me feel a bit saucier when I get home. I'm 50 quid lighter and still not convinced it'll do wonders for my sex life. I'll let you know what happens later on. Anybody here dares to go bare? Who's got Hollywood? I do, um, religiously. It does really make my eyes water, to be fair, but I just think it's a necessary evil. Um, it's right up there with, you know, my, my whole grooming routine. And then I feel an awful lot happier when I'm, you know, if I'm with somebody because I feel more confident. Who's happy with a bush? I, mean, I, I prefer it to be quite natural and a little bit of trimming at the bottom, but... <laughs> <laughs> OK, so... Just a, nat a, you know, natural look. Do so you like the flowers nice. but not the roots, as it were? <laughs> there you are. That's delightful. I had never realised that there was so much uh, variety. But I think that in a world where, uh, rightly, paedophilia and child sex is uh, viewed uh, as something that is harmful to society, I do worry about the innuendos associated with uh, ha having the, uh, the full lawn cutting, as it were. But the second aspect that worries me about it is that, for me, um, the joy of sex is about uh, far more than the uh, uh, anatomy. Do you trim, sir? Uh, no, I don't, because, as I say, I've never even thought about it. And as you can see, I don't need to do a lot of trimming. Uh, <laughs> so, that is interesting. How many guys here trim? Hands up. Hang on, that's most of you. If it's if I feel that I need to, to go and have a sack crack and back wax, then I'll go and have one. But I'll, otherwise, I'll just I will trim. So uh, well, I'll trim and then a bit into like a little kind of V shape thing around. The, yeah. <laughs> Ladies, do we like a boy to be neat and tidy down there? I've been blown back by a resounding yes. You don't want it shaved smooth, cos no. when all the hair comes off, it's that last chicken in the supermarket. <laughs> oh. When we asked 50 men and 50 women whether they trim their pubic hair, 92% of women and 60% of men said yes, they do like to keep things nice and tidy. When it comes to sex, men need educating. Of over one million visits to family planning clinics last year, just 10% were made by men. But I want all you men out there to know that ignorance is not an option. The footballers of Long Ashton near Bristol might be good on the pitch, but when it comes to sex education, they're way off the mark. Each week, we'll find out how little they know and we'll teach them everything they need to know from getting an STI test, to essential information about fertility and contraception. Today's sex education is the condom size test. OK, boys, hands up here. Who uses condoms? One, two... What, only three of you? Have you ever had any sort of problems with them ripping? Yeah, uh, every time. Every time for you? Any problems with them sometimes slipping off? <laughs> yeah. You've had that as well, that it's... Especially when the girl's on top. Really? 
These boys' experiences aren't uncommon. A recent study found that a third of all men have reported condoms splitting or slipping off during sex. Why? Because when it comes to condoms, size matters. And a quarter of blokes don't know that condoms come in all different sizes. So how do these guys measure up? I'm now going to ask those who dare to drop their trousers. So lads, drop them. This is all in the name of education. After the pill, condoms are the most popular form of contraceptive. Get the right fit, and they're the most effective form of protection from STIs and are 98% successful at preventing unwanted pregnancy. To make sure these boys measure up, GP Dr Rada Modgill is on hand. For condom size, it's actually girth rather than length that matters. So the average condom you find in the shops is going to be a medium size, OK, which is going to be um, average girth of 12 to 13 centimetres when erect. So it's not length but girth that's important when choosing a condom. Dr Rada's got her girth gauge, a carrot and a measuring tape. So what you need to do is when you're erect, you need to measure the widest point. I want you to measure it in centimetres and measure it around and be accurate, OK? All right, lads, so we're going to give you a tape measure each. Me and the doc have done our bit, so how will the boys measure up? We'll find out the lads' vital statistics later. Now, that is fascinating. Only half of those lads bother to use a condom when they sleep with girls. Who doesn't like using them? Why? Because when you're with a guy and you're intimate, you have to stop to put it on. And that, for me, that just spoils the moment. And to stop, I, put the light on and try and... I just hate condoms, I always have to. I've slept with a lot of guys and I rarely use condoms. I've never, ever, ever caught anything. <gasps> so, <Whoa>. well, <laughs> that's... Well, maybe Lady you're Luck's very, on your side. You're very... Lady Luck is most definitely on your side. Okay. But a bigger passion killer than a condom is an STI. Aha, uh -huh. for me. But I would just, I wouldn't feel comfortable having sex without a condom, knowing that you could pick up anything. I think there is a, a, a strong element of, well, this happens to someone else. It doesn't happen to us. You just kind of get caught up in the moment and you just, there and then, and just for the whole passion of everything. I mean, it's just like, hey, I'm going to have sex right now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and yeah. it's going to be hot and it's going to be good. Do you not worry about getting the girl pregnant? Girl? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm terribly sorry. <laughs> you know, would you walk down along the M25 and just run across the freeway and say, it's not going to happen to me, your car's not going to bump into me. It's the same sort of thing. You can have a really active sex life. Come on, it takes a split second just to be a little bit more responsible and say, you know, it, it, of course it's going to happen to you, you know. It, it's, have you always used a condom, though? Always. It's better to be safe than sorry. If you're going to put yourself out there or in there, then <laughs> best to be protected and best to know what you're going in there with. We asked 100 people if they always use a condom with a new sexual partner. Worryingly, 22% of women and 40% of men said no, they don't always use protection. Meet Ryan. Ashley. And Alan. Three typical teenage boys whose hobbies are skateboarding, computer gaming, music and pornography. And they're not alone. In our television survey on teenage attitudes to sex, we've discovered 58% of 14 to 17-year-olds interviewed have viewed pornography. And 5% of the boys surveyed look at it every single day. And the place they watch most is online. Be warned. The nature of these lads' online viewing is shocking. So what kind of stuff are you looking at on the internet? More or less everybody watches, like, the straight porn. And then there's, like, I've seen, like, lesbian, like most people. And you can see, like, pregnant women having sex, which is a bit odd. How did you get access to that? It was just on the website, really. You can get all different categories and stuff like that. And... So are you able to see anything you want to, really, on the net, do you reckon? Yes. When we do go on our computers, it's always MSN, MySpace and stuff like that. Then people will go, oh, check out this and I'll send you a link. It'll just be something really mental. So have you guys ever seen anything really extreme? Seen some pretty grim stuff. 
um, but I've seen two women and they were taking a dump and they uh, were eating it. But then they uh, made out with each other and they were throwing up while they were making out. Despite the shocking nature of this clip, it's become cult viewing with millions of hits. But is, is that kind of stuff sort of frequent around school then, that, that you get sent? Yeah. Or you get shown on your phone, like, someone comes out, oh, have a look at this. What I'm shocked by is the amount of porn that they've got access to, really. And I shouldn't be surprised by that, but I am. And how graphic that they, that they were being really surprised me. And in a way, I kind of think, if their parents knew what they're looking at, you really would think that, I don't know, maybe they would, they would intervene. I've arranged to meet Ryan's mum and dad to find out if they know what he's been watching. So, have you guys got any idea what, what your son's looking at on the internet? Um, well, Ryan was on his laptop in his bedroom and uh, we asked him to go and post a letter for us. And I walked upstairs and he left his bedroom door open and the laptop was there, and there's this woman with her legs wide open on that. And I looked in the bedroom, and I couldn't, I looked at it, I thought, what am I looking at? I couldn't believe what we're looking at. And I said, Tanya, come and have a look at this. <laughs> I, and I, did, I didn't know what, what to do. And I said, what do we do? What do you say? How do you, you know, what do you do about it? Cause you're But Ryan's parents don't know about the really extreme pornography that he's seen. I'm about to show them and some other concerned parents. This particular link is something that a lot of teenagers are, are looking at and talking about. Um, I've not seen this either, so this will be interesting. Oh, oh God! <laughs> ah! Oh, God! Oh, that is... Oh, no! Oh, no. Oh. What sort of a woman would do that? <coughs> That's... Oh, my God. Oh, yeah. That's... Are you all right? No. Oh. Knowing that teenagers are watching that, that is sickening. Because I, I think if they're, they're having to find that sort of thing out and look at that sort of thing, I've, I've done my job as a parent. And, you know, that's what you're trying to do, you know, make them, you know, give a good upbringing, so they know what's right and what's wrong, and that is most definitely wrong. If I caught them watching this, I would be... I, I would have to take their computers off of them. I'd, I'd just be so angry. I'm totally freaked out. So now Ryan's parents know what he's up to, they can do something about it. These are the simple measures you can follow to protect your children. Download free adult content filters online. They restrict the websites your kids can access and monitor what sites they're visiting. It's also a good idea to put the family computer in the living room so you can keep a close eye on your children's internet use. Coming up, how pornography affects teenagers' body perception. Because fake is what you think normal, mm. you prefer fake boobs. Plus, my footballers get to grips with their penis size. Six and a half. Sixty. <laughs> <laughs> We Brits spend a phenomenal two and a half billion pounds a year on underwear. Lingerie retailers would have us believe the style of undies you choose has a direct influence on the type of sex life you have. I mean, look, look at this. You know, this is what I'd wear every day, like a big, a big sports bra. As if I'm going to play, you know, in the tennis finals at Wimbledon. Check out the size, big, massive, beige pants. With the odd period stain inside. <laughs> I do have some sort of pretty, sexy bras, but they've just kind of got thrown away at the back. I don't wear them anymore. So, yeah, I really do need to make more of an effort. And actually, I'm quite excited about seeing what really nice underwear is out there that might just put a little bit of zing back in the bedroom. So farewell, beige, massive pants. Listen, right, I'm a woman defeated. I know my pants are up to scratch. So I'm going to go and check out this beautiful laundry store to see whether they can turn me into a sexier woman. Oh, I don't think so. Would you like mustard on your sausage, sir? I have to say, right, some women might go for this. Not in a million years. I'd be laughing my way into bed. It's horrible. I feel like a hooker. Pretty woman, I ain't. No. No, no, no. Look, check this out. I mean, in this, I feel like I was about to have an affair with a milkman. Now, I don't feel too bad about this. This fits really, really well. 
hoiks my bosoms up. The um, the knickers are more like kind of like little shorts, so you know I don't feel too much like a whore. Seriously, I mean this, and all the girls out there will know what I'm talking about. It's amazing what a decent pair of pants can do for you in terms of making you feel just a bit sexier. So I'm going to try these out tonight. So are the claims true? Can great underwear really have a big impact on my sex life? Find out later. Who here thinks that underwear is important in terms of making you feel like a goddess, improving your sex life? Look at your face on the back row. You're like, what? Underwear? <laughs> is, is it not important to you? Oh, I wouldn't want grubby, ugly underwear, no. I, I, I like to look pretty like any woman would, but in my experience with my partners, what underwear I had on made no difference whatsoever. <laughs> Lads, who here quite likes the whole kind of lacy, blah boom type of thing? No, I, I, I just I love lace. If a girl wears lace, it looks nice, it feels different, and it's just it's cool. So for you, it's a turn on. Yeah, definitely. If I get into bed with my girlfriend, she's sometimes so embarrassed by what she's wearing that she doesn't doesn't feel sexy. Just rolls over, goes to sleep. Other night, she's got a matching pair on and it's completely different. Does it change your mood? You know when you slip on those really expensive knickers and the bra, does it change your mood? Well, yeah, it's about doing something for yourself. Every morning, putting on nice underwear, even if you're not, no one's going to see you in it, it's like you know that you're wearing it. Yeah. If I knew I was going out on a date, I wouldn't put, like, potato sack pants on. I'd put, like, a nice pair of pants on. What? Is there such a thing, potato sack pants? pants? Well, you know, <laughs> <laughs> just pants that, like, just one every, every day, like, that you play football in, for example. Yeah. Do boys all have in their underwear drawer a pair of pants that are a bit threadbare and they're, they're your potato sack pants? Yeah, no, yeah. Football pants. Yeah. Really? Your football pants? So you've got monkey pants too? We asked 100 men and women if they think sexy underwear is important. 64% of women said yes, compared to just 24% of men. So, girls, bear it in mind before splashing your cash. The Long Ashton football team are getting a lesson in wearing the right size condoms. These boys like to score both on and off the pitch, but shockingly, they rarely see the point of wearing protection. Who uses condoms? Ugh. What, only three of you? Men often cite unreliability as a reason for not wearing condoms. 35% of men have reported splits and slip-offs during sex, but there is a solution, finding the right size condom. Do you know what condom size you no. are? No. No. So, armed with a tape measure and some happy thoughts, my lads have been set the task of measuring the girth of their erect members. Are you measuring the right bit? Centimetres, not inches. I think you've got the wrong side of the tape measure. Standard size condoms will only fit perfectly if the penis girth is between 12 and 13 centimetres. So you've all gone and measured yourselves, yeah? Let's have some results. I'm 15. You're 15 centimetres. 15 centimetres. 13. 15 and a half. 15 and a half? 15. 60. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell the truth, I've all asked 12. So there's a four centimetre difference between you two. So are these guys wearing the right condoms? Uh, no, you're definitely not wearing the right size. The chance of slip, you know, slippage or breakage, bursting of the condoms when you use them is really, really high. And there's an increased risk of getting STIs and possible infertility later on. Two thirds of our lads claim the girth of their penis is larger than average. Big boys whose erect girth is greater than 13 centimetres should look for condoms like these. Stick with regular size condoms if your penis's girth is between 12 and 13 centimetres. And if your girth is 12 centimetres or less, go for these slimline brands. So, it really has been a sex education for my boys. I mean, you were, what, 15 centimetres? Yeah. So actually, really, you should be wearing extra large condoms. Did you know that? Yeah, no, I didn't know that, no. And you all know now what size you are, you all know what type of condom you need, so you can go and use them safely and appropriately. I hope the next time they shoot and score with a lady, they'll be wearing a correctly fitting condom with pride. <laughs> <laughs> The Sex Education Show is more than a TV series. You can go online too. 
go to the Channel Force Experience website for answers to questions about the first time, the single life, sex and relationships and pregnancy based on real people's real experiences. You can also find out everything you need to know about male and female genitals, STI testing, contraception and what happens to the body during pregnancy. Visit channel4.com forward slash Sexperience UK for exclusive video and interactive material. The website features people talking very frankly about their personal experiences of sex. So for under 18s, parental guidance is recommended. Our teenage survey revealed that almost a third of 14 to 17 year olds view pornography regularly. Everywhere they look, sex is on view. Nudity is pretty much everywhere. You see all naked bodies all the time on like the internet. Internet, friends' phones. Magazines, internet. Apparently 80% of the internet is porn no websites. I told you that one. <laughs> as well as the rise in availability of pornography, Britain has also seen a huge increase in levels of body dysmorphia. One recent survey suggests that 92% of teenage girls aren't happy with their bodies. The women are like big chested, nice hair, very pretty. One in five teenagers worry about the size or shape of their genitals. What your friends are really talking about is uh, what they saw on their phone, what's on, what, 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 what those things on the internet, who's got the biggest willy and stuff like that. Like. I want to find out how much porn is distorting teenagers' perceptions of what real men and women look like. Big First, I want to discover what these boys think is the average British flaccid penis length. I've lined up five, ranging from three to six inches. OK, boys, in front of you, you have got five penises in their flaccid state. I want you to decide which penis you think is the average size for a British male. This one. Probably that one. I'll, I'll go for this one. I would have said number three. Right, lads. The majority of you picked out three or four, OK, as the average British male penis. How would you feel, boys, if I told you that actually the average British male penis size is this one, number one? I feel I'm happy. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Just answer for me why you all felt that it was much bigger than that. Because of porn and stuff like that, because that's not what you see. Is like what do you see in is pornography? Is... <laughs> 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 Massive ones, <laughs> big. big jump. So the boys chose big a whopping jump. five inches as their average length. They're over by a whole two inches. Clearly, these boys have been influenced by looking at larger penises in porn. Girls, in you come. Next, how will the teenagers react to real breasts? I've lined up a selection of natural, normal, healthy young women's breasts. How will they measure up to this surgically enhanced porno perfect pair? First up, a fine set of real 32 Cs. They're quite saggy. OK, so you think they're saggy? And they've sort of got funny nipples, sort of. Blimey, these girls are harsh. Will the boys be less critical? White and pasty, <laughs> yeah. Bit. White and pasty? Bit saggy. Bit saggy, yeah. Saggy, white like, and pasty. They're a bit low down. They don't have any, what's it called? Cleavage. Uh, cleavage, that's it. Next up, some all-natural 32 E's. What about this pair of breasts? They're really big and, like, saggy and stuff. OK, so they're, they're really big and they're really saggy. For me, they're too big. Yeah, they're too big. Finally, another set of 34 Ds, but the size and perfectly round shape has been crafted by a surgeon's knife. They're, They're good. Best. What is it about this pair that you like? Or that you think's better? Because all, all, like, looping, whereas these are more, like, together. They kind of look better. They look firm. Like, they're, like, similar sizes. They don't sag. Nice and round. Just point out the best pair of breasts, please. I'd say that one. Yeah, that one. The best. best. Yeah. <laughs> Are the yeah. ones in the middle? Yes. So all of you were in agreement, basically, that the best pair of breasts were these ones here. Yep. OK, because you felt that they were high up, they were round, evenly spaced, good cleavage. Yeah. They also happen to be fake. OK, yeah. they are surgically enhanced breasts. But you find that attractive? Yeah. Why do you think that is? We're just going to want the plastic ones because 
that's what we're suggested to want. OK. And it's what we've seen more of, really. You see more women flashing their plastic breasts than you would see women fla yeah. so you think So you think that's normal, and then so. normal becomes right to you, mm. and then because fake is what you think normal, mm. you prefer fake boobs. So there you have it. 15 teenagers all highly critical of normal bodies. What's sad is they're putting pressure on themselves and each other, convinced by the sexual imagery they see that porn-style plastic is perfection. Coming up, I investigate whether the ancient art of tantric sex could be the key to everlasting happiness in the bedroom. Now, OK, I've not done this in a long time. And find out if my Hollywood wax and some new lingerie really have made any difference to my sex life. So here's what happened last night. Men apparently think about sex every 52 seconds, but how much do they actually know about their own bodies? Average size and shape? What is or isn't normal? Enough worrying and wondering, it's time to take a closer look at the anatomy of men's genitals, which means there will be some nudity in this film. Many men worry about their genitals, whether they're too big, not big enough, too thin, too fat, too droopy or too veiny. The truth is, penis length and girth and testicle size all vary widely. The male body undergoes big changes during puberty, which begins around 13 and a half, but it can occur as early as 9 or as late as 18. The first external sign is the enlargement of the testicles. During puberty, the testicles produce a lot of testosterone, the hormone that causes boys to develop deeper voices, bigger muscles and body and facial hair. Some boys get a swelling underneath their nipples, which can look like the start of breasts. They shouldn't panic though, they're not, and it's only temporary. In someone uncircumcised like Sam, the head of the penis is covered by a protective foreskin. At the tip of the penis is the meatus, or opening of the urethra, where urine and semen come out. In men, unlike women, the urethra has both a urinary and reproductive function. The little ridge that runs all the way around the bottom of the head of the penis is called the corona, and just below the spot on the underside of the penis, where the corona makes a little V-shape, is a frenulum. For some men, the corona and frenulum are the most sensitive areas of the penis. In circumcised men, this area is less sensitive. It's important to remember to return the foreskin over the head of the penis, otherwise there's a small risk of getting a paraphimosis, which is a ballooning of the foreskin. If this happens, you should see a doctor immediately. The shaft of the penis contains three cylinders of spongy tissue. When a man is aroused, these fill with blood and enlarge to produce an erection. Erections can occur any time from the onset of this sexual maturity. The length of the flaccid penis is no guide to the size of the erect penis. In fact, an average or smaller penis increases more proportionally when it becomes erect than a larger one. The testicles are where the sperm is produced. They are situated inside the scrotum and hang outside the body to keep them slightly cooler than body temperature to protect the sperm. In about 80% of men, one testicle hangs lower than the other one, but this doesn't matter in any way. Many men experience great anxiety over their genitals, but they really shouldn't. There's a huge variation in normal size and shape, and all function perfectly well. Go online to the Channel 4 Sexperience website to download more sex education lessons, including female anatomy, STI testing, contraception, and what happens to the body during pregnancy. Visit the website for exclusive material at channel4.com forward slash sexperienceuk. Some of the content there is quite strong, so if you're under 18, do check with your parents first. Do you know what? There's hundreds of books on the market about how to improve your sex life and how to have an explosive orgasm. We spend millions of pounds on sex manuals every year in the search for information to improve our sex lives. And it used to be the Kama Sutra, it used to be the joy of sex, but everybody talks about tantric sex. And uh, Sting and Trudy Styler can go at it for hours using tantric sex. And they've been together for 26 years. But really, can tantra be the secret to improving your sex life? Originating in India more than 6,000 years ago, tantric sex is all about delaying orgasm. But to the uninitiated like me, it's a complete mystery. So I'm off for a lesson. Now, genuinely, 
I have no idea what to expect about this. My only sort of slight concern is, if you're going at it for hours and hours and hours, do you not chafe a bit? Um, I've got an open mind. Let's just find out. Let's find out what's going on. Hi, is that Tangerilla? I've booked a hundred pound lesson in the art of tantric sex with Tantra Leela. Lovely to Ooh. see you, lovely to have you I, here. I don't normally get a hug when I, that's, that's nice. Well, yes. Because I haven't brought my boyfriend, Tantra Leela's arranged for a stand-in. Yes. This is uh, Steffi. Hi. This is Anna. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Pleased to meet you. Um, what we're going to do is to take you through um, some tantric pleasuring rituals. If you want to change your sex life, you kind of have to remember what how nice pleasure is. So, so today what you're going to do is receive. You're going to just be pleasured as if you were a goddess. Well, that sounds like a pleasant change from the way things normally happen in my house. I usually... Th this, is, this is what normally happens. Mm -hmm. I hear him coming down from upstairs, so... He, comes down the stairs, plods off to the toilet. I can hear him having a big wee, OK? And then he'll shout to me from the bathroom and go, Hi, babe! That's normally what happens. And then he'll come into my bedroom, hop into bed, and that's his kind of, like, mating ritual. And yours. Well, yeah. No, and no just... and yours. Because I allow it. <laughs> yeah, and that's what... You're doing the other side of it. You're lying there waiting on a Saturday for those yeah. rituals to happen. I'm, I'm lying there in my bed with a cup of tea thinking, Oh, oh right, here we go. Do you know what I mean? So, um... Uh, so how's sex going to be great when you do that? Hmm, maybe she's got a point. According to the laws of Tantra, you and your partner must get in contact with your sexual energy well before penetration. To you and me, that's foreplay. So this is without being inside each other, then? Mm -hmm. So this is just something we hang out and do? So what you want to try and do is just feel turned on together. So if you're just doing this with him... Mm. <laughs> How does that make you feel? Well, you, you know, it's, it's nice. Yeah. Isn't it? so, and because you when did you feel that whole yeah, when did you, to you know, when did you last say to him, I love you, you're wonderful, you, you know, you're my Mr. Wonderful? I'm usually shouting at him about the cat food. With the foreplay over, time to move on to the main course. Do you want to be on top, as it were? Because, I mean, I'm literally naked. Ooh. Oh. Now, OK, I've not done this in a long time. So as I breathe out, you breathe in my out-breath, OK? Keeping eye contact. So. With tantric sex, you learn to control each other's breathing. This can delay orgasm, meaning sex lasts much longer. It's the complete opposite of a quickie. So if your partner's going... <laughs> and getting very excited, mm -hmm. you can go up to them and go... <sighs> and they calm down. So using this kind of rotation and just the sort of slight rocking and the oh. dancing, how long could you go for? You can actually have sex for hours in that position. So I won't go into any big deep meditation, we just do this. So will tantric sex live up to its claim to offer a deeper sexual experience and more intense orgasms? Not even the bikini wax was as embarrassing as that. Literally, I'm cringing. However, I do feel that I need to also qualify that what they're doing really does have merit, and I can totally see that most of us have kind of lost touch with intimacy, and that's why maybe our sex lives are a bit rocky, because to do that kind of stuff, you've got to let go. Um, and I'm not that good at that. I'm just going to go and get a drink. Anybody else tried a little bit of tantric sex? Tell me about your tantric session. What it is, is exactly what she was saying there. When you're kind of absolutely in tune with your partner, then you can have just like multiple orgasms all over your body. Hello. <laughs> It's well, not. This, this good is... sex is not to be rushed. Aha! Thank you very much. Good sex is not to be rushed. In my life, I feel like I'm constantly in a rush. I haven't got time. I haven't got time to do, you know, all the kind of domestic things, let alone having sex. Are we not having good sex because we feel like we've run out of time? You need to make a date with your partner. You need to make sure that you're maintaining your relationship because if you don't do that, things do slip. I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily call it tantric sex, but I think we do something similar where you just sort of hang out naked and... You talk, you're, just, you're just with each other, and then if you end up having sex, that's great. So you, you have just... the intimacy thing by hanging out with each other that's, naked. That's and when you've we just have the best connection. sex normally, yeah. Is, is it's, it's to do with 
and it's more to do with communication than anything else. Like the lady said over there, if you make time for one another and you give yourself the whole evening rather than... But that doesn't mean that you can't have a great quickie. No, but you get a quickie. You know, you I don't, I'm not well. saying the only, the only type of good sex is, is slow, long sex. We asked 50 men and 50 women whether they prefer to take their time over sex. 72% of women and 76% of men said that, yes, they do like to take things nice and slow. I've had a full Hollywood. Ow! And bought some sexy new undies. And had a tantric sex lesson, all of which claim to improve your sex life. But the proof is in the pudding. So here's what happened last night. OK, I've had my full bikini whites, I've had the lovely underwear, I've had the tantric sex lesson. Charles comes home, this is a sequence of events. I drop my pants and say, check this out, right? He bursts out laughing for ten minutes. He then finds it strangely erotic. We end up scooting upstairs for a little bit of How's Your Father. All goes to plan. The tantric sex didn't even get a look in. It was, it was funny. <laughs> So the morning after the night before, what have I learned in my attempt to get the magic back into the bedroom? Sex is in the mind, and if you feel good about yourself, then you're going to feel good in bed, essentially. And that, for me, has been really important. But my mission to get Britain talking about sex has only just begun. Over the next five weeks, I'll be investigating our sexual taboos. From STI testing... I would like a, a full sexual screening, really, just um, to give myself a clean bill of health. <laughs> to the truth about childbirth. Just shoot it out like this, like a bowling ball, and you're ready to catch it. Yeah. And I'll be taking an emotional roller coaster ride to discover if I can have a baby. It's not the end of the road, but it is serious. Next week, sexually transmitted infections. I put myself and Long Ashton FC in for a full screening. Have you ever used contraception with those girls? Any condoms or anything like that? Nice. I show teenagers some worst case scenarios of untreated infections. This will be your sex for life. <laughs> and I continue my investigation into the most effective ways to improve your sex life by I testing out burlesque. <laughs> It was unbelievable. I can completely recommend it. That's next Tuesday at the same time, and you can watch a variety of people talking openly about their sexual experiences at channel4.com slash sexexperienceuk. Well, next up all, meet Hilary, a wealthy businesswoman undercover in Rochdale as the secret millionaire. <laughs> <laughs>